so I'm continuing to think about death, <laughs> and it actually has a good effect on my mind. Um, it's quite, quite amazing. And so, uh, as I continue to go through the nine-point death meditation, there are three different conclusions. They're all related, but they're very similar. And so, when we reflect on the fact that death is definite, the conclusion we should arrive at is that I must practice the Dharma. And then when we reflect on the time of death is uncertain, then the conclusion is I must practice the Dharma continuously, beginning from right now. And the third one is that um, nothing can help us at the time of death except the Dharma. So again, the conclusion is I must practice beginning from right now and not pay attention to things like, well, we're not doing this anymore, accumulating wealth or taking care of our family and friends and all of the eight worldly concerns, but to really focus our minds on uh, developing ourselves so that at the time of death, whatever we've got in our spiritual kit bag is what we're going to use. And so um, this has been very, uh, seeing what my parents are experiencing with dementia, they both have vascular dementia, I see this very clearly, that what they've done for their entire life is what they're doing now. And in my mom's case, she still practices the piano every day. Every day she goes to the piano and brings her happiness. Um, and so probably she'll be playing hymns at the last moment, I hope. In my dad's case, before he was sort of wheelchair bound, he would go around the house, he used to be ele an electrician, and he would spend many, many hours feeling the walls and tracing lines with his hands. Well, that's what he practiced doing his whole life, and so in his compromised state, he's being an electrician. Now, he was an honest electrician, so I hope this holds him well at the time of death. But for those of us who are our practitioners, um, we can see that what we're doing now, the way we live our life, is how we're going to die. So then, you know, I can look at all these teachings that we've had from our dear teacher, Venerable Children, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and whoever your teacher is, and then I can go into a state of panic, like, okay, what do I practice? which is a ridiculous question, but that does come up. Like, what do I practice? There's so many things. And I remembered um, Venerable Children teaching um, something called the five powers or five forces during mind training like rays of the sun. So I, I went back and refreshed my memory about those teachings, which are like a, a condensed version of everything we should be doing every day. So I thought I'd just read through these. I'm sure you've heard them before, but it's, I find it's very good to refresh this. Um, so the five powers are motivation, white, the power of the white seed, the power of destruction, the power of aspiration, and the power of familiarity. And in the teaching that Venerable Children gave, she spent the, lo the huge amount of time on motivation. That took up most of the teaching. And if you have been to the Abbey or you're planning to come to the Abbey, you'll see that setting a motivation happens before we do anything, really. And it's this, this setting our motivation is directing our mind in the direction that we want it to go. Because otherwise, if, you, if your mind is like, if your mind is like uh, mine, it will just go wherever it likes. Um, so this is very, very important. So we don't want to let the primary and secondary afflictions arise. We don't want them to dominate our speech or body or mind for even a moment. So the more times we make a very strong motivation, the more likely we're going to carry through with this. And we know this from our worldly activities. You know, I had a strong determination as a teenager to learn how to ski. I did anything and everything to learn how to do it, to get the money and everything. Many of us went to university or college for many, many years. You know, we wanted to get a job that paid well, or we wanted a certain kind of knowledge. And so we will do anything, actually, with a certain motivation. But as a spiritual practitioner, you know, what, what are we aspiring for? And I'll get back to that a little later. Um, so Venerable Children has also taught us to set a motivation the minute our eyes open, or the minute we come to consciousness every day. And I found that this is just so, so helpful, but it has to, I have to reset it throughout the day. It's not good enough to set it the moment I wake up. And the first one is to not harm. And in her teachings she said, 
you know, whatever else you need to do in, in the day that's on your list of to-dos, this is actually the only one you have to do, that you should do, to not harm with body, speech, or mind. Then the second one is to cultivate um, virtue by doing virtuous actions. And the third one is to really hold our mind in bodhicitta. Um, and then to also tell ourselves um, that whenever possible, I must continue to develop my understanding of bodhicitta and to never ever lose it under any circumstance. And then she says it very nicely. I'm going to become familiar with bodhicitta. I'm not going to be separated from it from now until I attain awakening. A mind separated from bodhicitta is dwelling in affliction. So she says there's only three things to do. The first one is most important, not to harm, to create virtue, and to cultivate bod bodhicitta. So in the light of time, I'm going to speed on here. The second force or power is the power of the white seed, which is all about purifying and creating merit. And so we do this specifically by guarding our ethical conduct, being generous, and meditating. Now this also includes studying the Dharma, studying thought training teachings, cultivating bodhicitta that hasn't been cultivated, maintaining bodhicitta that has been cultivated, and doing purification practices circumambulating, taking refuge, taking precepts, all these things that we're actually taught to do all day long here at the Abbey is a way of purifying and building up the merit. And if we do that, Venerable Children says, we are creating the foundation for bodhicitta, which I think is very beautiful. Um, creating the foundation for bodhicitta, that is just such a, you know, we might say, well, how do you do that? Well, we just heard how to do it. The third power is the power of destruction. And this means seeing our self-centered attitude, which is something that we are always looking at here at the Abbey. And to see that our self-grasping ignorance is the real source of the problem. And those are the things that we want to destroy. So the minute we start thinking about I, me, and mine, we have actually lost sight of bodhicitta. And that is a terrifying thought when we're lost in I, me, and mine. I think the thing that grabbed me the most from this part of the teaching that Venerable gave was, um, so when we're stuck in these afflicted states, we have the inclination to neglect others. So I think none of us really want to think that we neglect others. But in fact, when we're focused on me and my problems and how you are the source of my problems, we're neglecting others. And we've also actually divorced ourselves from bodhicitta. And that's quite a frightening thing to contemplate. Then the other thing she mentioned in this part of the teaching, I don't know if I've had this conclusion, but I have to think about it some more. And she said, um, other people cannot send us to the lower realms but our afflicted mental states can. And so I suppose if I'm really stuck in the uh, rut of blame, then actually I am probably thinking that others are the reason why I'm in this afflicted state. And it's afflicted states that take us to the hell realm. And so it would be this just twisted way of perceiving something that is totally not true. So that's something I really want to think about. Um, that other people cannot send us to the hell realm. As she says, people can tell us to go to hell. <laughs> and we've had that experience. And I have to admit, I have thought that phrase myself. <laughs> um, anyway, we're the author of our own destiny, and no one else is. And then the fourth power is the, the power of aspiration. And she says that vows or aspirations or determinations, these are all words for the same thing. And so these aspirations, again, are ways of directing our mind in the way that we want to go. Um, in the teaching, she asked us to consider what we make aspirations for all day long. Are these aspirations for full awakening? Are they, to, are they aspirations so that we develop what bodhicitta we have? Or is it the aspiration for the next best cup of tea? Or, as Venerable Tarpas says, when things start going haywire in our mind, we start planning our next vacation, <laughs> or where we're going to go to get away. Um, so, I've had those thoughts. 
And Venerable Chodron says, our aspirations influence our mood. Hello. So if I have the aspiration to really not harm, and if that's really clear in my mind, then someone here could tell me to go to Newport. <laughs> and I would just take it in stride, I think. But it's a whole lot of work. So that's the power of aspiration. I'm going to just jump ahead here so that you get a, f a taste of these five, and then you can go to tubedinchildren.org to get the full teaching from Venerable Children. Um, oh, and the thing about the power of aspiration, this is very beautiful. She says that we want to make sure that in a future life, we are open, receptive, and humble, so that, we can, so that when we meet a teacher, so one of our aspirations should be, you know, I want to meet authentic spiritual teachers who are teaching the Dharma, so that in a future life, when we meet these teachers, that we actually recognize them and not start criticizing them. And I have a story that I'm not going to share right now. It's very embarrassing about a very, it's not Venerable Children, but a very prominent teacher. And I just thought, I can't understand what you're saying. I just don't get it. And then I started feeling critical, and I couldn't see how that person could help me. So I really have to make the aspiration that for what, whoever shows up, regardless of how they articulate the teachings, that I'm open to it. And that's, that's a very big aspiration that I have. So that we can become a suitable vessel, and so that we can really take the teachings in. And the fifth power is the power of familiarity. And this is the one where we have to look at our habitual patterns. So how are you when you're feeling fantastic? I know that prior to living to the Abbey, and on some days at the Abbey, if I'm feeling just so healthy and so happy, how strong is my practice? Well, I am, I'm actually having thoughts about going to the forest and uh, being out in the sunshine and seeing the view, and I'm not really thinking of other sentient beings. And then when I get really sick, I'm really sort of bummed out that I'm, well, it's kind of twisted. Okay, so I'm not helping sentient beings so much when I'm sick, but I'm really more focused on my own suffering. And so this power of familiarity is that we, whatever circumstance we're in, our practice is first and foremost. You know, so that when someone does tell us to go to Newport, I'm going to think about helping them and seeing how I can benefit them and not telling them to do the same. Um, so with all of these powers, these forces, they are really directing us to what's important. And it is just continuing to develop our good qualities, abandoning the self-centered attitude and seeing it, so that we lay down these tracks of what we do when it gets really tough. And uh, so I find these five very inspiring.